The room buzzes with chatter and toasts as a group of handsome gents, dressed to the nines in their dapper suits and pricey shoes, make their way from this foray to the next, a ritzy gentleman's club. The ladies, flaunting an 80s Queen Elizabeth vibe, add an extra dash of elegance to the scene. Despite the night's festivities, you'd expect these guys to be wiped out, maybe even a tad tipsy. But the night is still young for our tall, handsome blonde, who's got one more stop on his party itinerary, a gambling house. His dark-haired buddy tries to talk him out of it, but Lucas von Ewald, the red-haired stunner and only son of Count Ewald, vice-chancellor of the House of Lords of Burked Empire, tells him to chill and enjoy the moment. Surprisingly, the gambling house appears almost deserted, which isn't exactly what they had in mind for their nightcap. But the raven-haired Eric Faber, eldest son of the steel industry giant Faber household, has a hunch that the real fun is just about to start. He encourages the guys to roll with it. As they step inside, they find tables topped with cards and eager players hoping to hit the jackpot. Not so empty after all, huh? A chaperone spots them and happily welcomes them, expressing his concern for our blondie to Lucas. Lucas takes the cue to introduce his blonde friend, telling tales of his recent chaotic exploits that have made headlines and his triumphant victory in naval warfare. He then introduces the blondie as Captain Bastion Klovitz, the Empire's hero, and the room goes silent. The chaperone, totally gobsmacked, thanks the captain and leads them to a suite on the second floor. As they follow, Bastion warns Lucas about his over-the-top introductions, but Lucas just shrugs it off, claiming he's just bragging about his pal. Just then, a man known around town as the Beggar Duke, stumbles into the room and drops to his knees. He's pleading with his boss for another shot at the gaming table, rambling on about the stakes he's yet to throw down. His boss rolls his eyes but asks what's up for grabs anyway. The Duke, desperate and defeated, scrambles for an answer and then... Eureka! He's got it. He's gonna bet his own daughter. He starts raving about her beauty, completely unhinged and well aware of how tempting his offer is. It's clear the guy's lost it to the gambling fever. He keeps yammering on, oblivious to the absurdity of his words, until a tap on his shoulder brings him back to reality. Are you really gonna take responsibility for that? A voice asks. The question hits him hard and he spins around to face the speaker. It's Eric, kneeling in front of him, all cool and composed. He repeats the question and the Duke, still in his madness, reaffirms his bet, going on and on about his daughter being the most beautiful woman in the Empire, talk about convenient. Eric's all fired up now. This game just got a whole lot more interesting, and even though the stakes are high, he's ready for the next round. The red-headed joker in their group sees this as just another fun game, but something's off with Bastion. Eric nudges him to play along, and after a moment's hesitation, Bastion agrees. Like a scene straight out of a poker movie, the gens settle in, and our empire hero shuffles the cards and deals them out. Shall we start? He asks. Well, duh. The room's thick with tension as the game heats up. Everyone's watching closely as these guys duke it out for the title of Gambling King. One dude, totally clueless about what's going on, asks his neighbor for the lowdown and gets filled in about the Duke's crazy bet. Fast forward a bit and the Duke's staring at his cards like they're a death sentence. Eric and Lucas are equally dismayed, but all eyes are on Bastion. He checks his hand, lays his last card down, and... Bam! The room goes wild. It's a perfect win. Amidst the chaos, the Duke sinks further into defeat, barely having time to process his loss before two guys behind him remind him of his bet and tell him to get ready for his new son-in-law. Bastion, taking in the madness, decides he's had enough. He gets up to leave, silencing the uproar as he exits. However, Lucas gives him an earful about how he needs to take his bet seriously. Eric's backing him up, saying it's only fair that they enjoy the spoils of the game. But the Duke? He's not having any of it. He lunges at Bastion, begging for another shot. Bastion holds his gaze, his icy blue eyes meeting the Duke's sea green ones. And then, without missing a beat, he shoves him off like it's nothing. Lucas, being the troublemaker he is, orders the guards to bring in the Duke's daughter. The Duke stuck in his mess, grits his teeth but doesn't back down. He yells at Bastion, warning him about the dangers of messing with his daughter who has the blood of the Imperial family flowing through her veins. Fast forward to midnight. 
Under a starlit sky, we see a stunning young lady crocheting away, lost in thought. She's worried about her dad and when he'll come home. Next to her, a girl named Tira stirs in her sleep. Waking up, she asks Odette about their father. Odette reassures her, even though she herself can't shake off her unease. Odette then tucks Tira into bed, dismissing her fears about the creepy night sounds, insisting it's just the wind. But Tira isn't convinced. She tells Odette she's not a baby anymore, earning a smile and an eye roll from her sister. Back at the dining table, Odette is making a mental checklist of things to do before hitting the sack, including selling the lace she's been working on. Her mind drifts back to a year ago when they had to move due to their dad's money troubles. She remembers Tira's words about the crying noises, but to Odette, those sounds are comforting, a reminder of the roof they have over their heads, thanks to the Imperial family. Her gaze lands on an old photo of her late mother, Princess Helene. She was the Empire's sweetheart, engaged to Crown Prince Rovida and adored by all. But three months before the wedding, she disappeared, running off with Duke Dyson, her secret lover from a minor clan. The news rocked the entire empire. The emperor, heartbroken and disappointed, washes his hands off his daughter. He takes back all her fancy titles and property, and before you know it, she's out of there. Boom! Just like that, her mother goes from royal to rags. But even in the face of it all, her mom never throws in the towel. Now, let's fast forward a bit. Little Odette is blossoming into a fine teenager under the golden sun. One afternoon, her mom drops some serious life advice on her. She tells her to keep her head high, especially when the going gets tough. She's dead set on getting their royal status back, so she insists on Odette getting a top-notch education to prepare for D-Day. Odette learns everything her mom throws her way, dancing, etiquette, music, painting, and of course, language. But then, tragedy strikes one quiet night. Darling, promise me you'll fight to return us to our glory days, her mother whispers with her last breath. And just like that, she's gone, leaving Odette alone with her dreams and a harsh reality. Back in the present, Odette's staring blankly at this old picture when the harsh reality hits her, she's gonna end up just like her mom. Suddenly, a knock on the door jolts her back to reality. Who's there? She shouts, racing towards the door. She swings it wide open to find a uniformed man standing there, not wasting any time with small talk. You Odette? He grills her, and she replies with a quick yes. She asks about her dad, knowing this guy probably knows something. But all he does is tell her to follow him, hinting that her old man might be in some deep financial trouble. The only thought running through her mind is, he's let us down, again. Our poor Odette puts on a brave face, heading back into her room to get ready. Even the guard can't help but feel sorry for her. She's lost in memories of her childhood, remembering her mom's lessons as she gets ready. Finally, she slips on her hat and veil and tells the guard she's good to go. Meanwhile, Odette's father is pleading with the chaperone from earlier. He's begging him to spare his daughter, reminding him of her royal blood. But the chaperone isn't having it. He blames the Duke for putting his own daughter at risk and tells him that a guard was already sent to get Odette. That's when the gravity of what he's done really hits him. Back in the room, Lucas is teasing Bastion about meeting the Emperor's granddaughter. Bastion doesn't buy it though, he's doubting everything the beggar Duke says. He even asks his buddies if they believe it, leading to a mini-argument between Lucas and Eric that earns them an eye roll. Then, the guard announces Odette's arrival. Everyone turns to look, eager to see the Duke's daughter. She walks in with grace, her veil casting mysterious shadows on her face and her wild hair dancing with each step. She goes straight to her dad who's practically a heap on the floor, asking about his debts. There are whispers among the men about her dignified behavior, given she doesn't seem to realize how bad things are. But then Eric spills the beans, telling her about the bet her dad made. Her eyes go wide with shock as Eric points towards the winner, Bastion. Father, she screams, but he's already collapsed at her feet, begging for mercy and making lame excuses. Odette squares her shoulders and turns to Bastion, recognizing his uniform as that of the Navy from the capital. She's torn, should she run away with the man she once knew as her dad? But where would she go? The guards are waiting right outside. She takes a deep breath and approaches Bastion, accusing him of participating in such a shady act. 
He replies with a curt response, making it clear that sometimes, legality isn't always the best solution. Odette is trying her best to make Bastion see sense. She's all righteous fury and pleading eyes, begging him to let her dad off the hook. She even offers to pay off her father's debts, as if she's rolling in dough. But Bastion's having none of it. He's the one calling the shots here, not her. Show me your face, he demands, making it clear he's not interested in her money or trading her for anything. All he wants is for her to lift that veil and end this drama. The room falls silent, save for Lucas and Eric who are clearly enjoying the show. But Bastion? He's thinking things through, wondering what would happen if he lets her go. Her dad would probably just bet her off to another guy. Meanwhile, Beggar Duke is practically begging Odette to do whatever it takes to secure their freedom. Bastion tells her to play by his rules since she's being so stubborn. She reaches up and pulls off her veil. The room goes dead silent as everyone gets their first look at Odette. Her long, wild hair is a striking mix of black and violet, cascading down to her waist. And her eyes, they're like emerald pools you could get lost in. Bastion can't help but remember Beggar Duke bragging about his beautiful daughter. At least he wasn't lying about that, he muses to himself. Fast forward to the next morning. Beggar Duke is passed out, snoring like a freight train. Tira is watching him with pure disgust, asking Odette if she can lock him in. Odette doesn't care what happens to him at this point, she's too exhausted. But Tira's not letting it go. She's all riled up about their dad's drinking and betting habits. She's used to that, but what he did to Odette is a whole new level of low. She can't believe he's sleeping like a baby after what he's done. All Odette cares about is getting home safe, but she can't help replaying last night's events in her mind, especially the part where she had to take off her veil. Tira is still going on about their dad, even threatening to report him to the Imperial family. But Odette shuts her down quickly, reminding her that they might stop helping them if they find out about their dad's shady dealings. She doesn't tell Tira this, though. Instead, she just looks at her and asks for a promise. Tira apologizes and promises to drop the subject. Odette pulls her into a hug, knowing their chances of getting any help from the Imperial family are slim to none. Now, let's take a little detour to Arden, a charming coastal city on the outskirts of the capital. It's got that salty sea breeze and grand mansions that whisper tales of royalty and noble families. The North offers views that'll take your breath away, earning it the nickname Arden Jewel. Once upon a time, this land was home to the prestigious Count clan. But as time moved on, they struggled to keep up and eventually lost their ancestral home. Enter the Clawitz clan, the new kids on the block who are taking the empire's economy by storm. Their wealth and influence are spreading faster than a forest fire in the dry season. They're smart cookies, these guys, with a knack for business and a monopoly on Empire Berg's railway system. When the Count clan's prized property went up for grabs, they pounced on it like hungry lions, cementing their place at the top of the food chain. Now, picture this, Bastion's cruising into his family mansion in his shiny car, parking it right in front of the massive mansion doors. Out comes Maria Gross, Bastion's aunt, strutting around like she owns the place. She casts a curious glance at his ride, questioning why he always goes against his dad's wishes, but Bastion just shrugs it off. He extends a hand towards her, but she ignores it, making a snide remark about not being rich enough to afford a chauffeur. Yeah right. They stroll into the mansion together, and let me tell you, this place is something else. It's got maids lined up ready to pamper him, a red carpet that seems to go on forever, chandeliers that sparkle like diamonds, and walls adorned with vintage picture frames and flowers. As they catch up, they chat about his father and the mansion, which Bastion dismisses as nothing more than a fancy prison. Aunt Maria, ever the opportunist, can't help but think about the fortune Bastion inherited from his mother. She tries to probe him about why his grandfather chose him as the heir, leaving Bastion a bit clueless. But Aunt Maria keeps her cool, dropping the bombshell that his brother is engaged to Count Klein's daughter. She's planning to announce it at the party later that night and gushes about how thrilled their father is about the union. But get this, Franz, Bastion's half-brother, is actually the son of a noblewoman. Their dad, who's obsessed with status, didn't hesitate for a second before declaring Franz the heir to the clan. And now that he's marrying a noble, their dad's over the moon. Aunt Maria then turns her attention back to Bastion, urging him to find a wife and start his own family. 
She also warns him to steer clear of Princess Isabel, apparently, she's bad news. But Bastion just laughs it off, telling her he's not interested in the princess. Aunt Maria reminds him that the Emperor might not see things the same way, especially after what happened with his sister, Princess Helene. Bastion's mind immediately flashes back to the casino night when his father mentioned the name Helene and something about imperial blood. But Aunt Maria snaps him out of his thoughts, and he reassures her with a charming smile that she has nothing to worry about. In the next scene, the sun is setting, casting a warm glow on the Empire Bird's imperial palace. Its grandeur and wealth are on full display, but inside, it's a different story. The Empress is having a major meltdown. She's tossing around photos of Bastion, photos she found in her daughter's room, and it's not pretty. The Emperor is trying to calm her down, but she's too busy freaking out over the fact that their daughter is mooning over some other guy while she's set to marry. Isabel is getting married, and that's final, he tells her, but the Empress isn't listening. She brings up Princess Helene and her tragic love story, which instantly earns her an apology from her husband. He's not thrilled about the topic, but he lets her continue. The conversation takes a sharp turn towards Duke Dyson's reckless behavior and his daughter, Odette. It's clear the Empress is worried about her, especially with her father's antics. What if something happens to Odette, she exclaims. The Emperor explains that he's been keeping an eye on the situation because of his sister, Helene. But the Empress cuts him off, saying she can't stand the Duke, but she also can't bear to see Odette suffer. And then she drops the bombshell, she wants Bastion to marry Odette. The Emperor is taken aback, but the Empress insists that Bastion, despite his low status, is a hero and deserves a wife from the Imperial family. Plus, he comes from a wealthy clan. The Emperor is still skeptical, asking why Bastion would choose Odette over other options. That's when the Empress reminds him of the Imperial blood in Odette's veins. She believes this arrangement will protect Isabel and secure her marriage. Somewhere else in the palace, Bastion is descending the grand staircase blending in with the crowd. His mind is on his father who declined his mother's fortune and the chance to elevate his status by marrying a noblewoman. Suddenly, he spots Sandrine de Lavier, the fiery redhead and Lucas' cousin. She's the duke's daughter and also the richest woman in Pelia. She saunters over, asking him about his brother's engagement. With a smirk, he tells her it's a good thing for their clan. She mimics his response, admitting she's just being nosy. But here's the thing, Sandrine was once married to Count Renat, but they're getting a divorce due to unresolved issues. There are whispers that she'll return to her role as the Duke's darling daughter next year, as if nothing ever happened. After all, she's part of the powerful Lavier clan. Hey, Bastion! Sandrine calls out, her eyes glinting with mischief. She teases him about his love life, warning him not to rush into anything foolish. Bastion, in his classic sarcastic style, shoots back, reminding her that trends in marriage can change just like that. He advises her not to get her hopes up too high. His words leave her momentarily speechless, but he brushes it off as friendly advice. Their conversation might sound a bit heated to an outsider, but this is their way of bonding. Sandrine quickly changes the subject, hinting that Bastion's mother is giving them the side eye. She praises his strategic mind before disappearing into the crowd, leaving whispers of her remarriage plans in her wake. Word gets around to Aunt Maria, who seems less than thrilled about the news. Meanwhile, Bastion finds himself lost in thought, reminiscing about that fateful night at the casino. He remembers Odette's calm demeanor and porcelain complexion but also her father's destructive habits. His thoughts are interrupted by Aunt Maria, who greets him with a warmth that belies their recent conversation. Bastion tries to play it cool, claiming he needs time to adjust to the party atmosphere. But Aunt Maria isn't buying it, reminding him of the time he nearly met his end after a wolf chase. She recalls how she had been outside taking a break when she heard his cries for help. Back in the mansion, as Bastion was being treated, Aunt Maria gave the teacher a piece of her mind for not keeping a closer eye on Bastion. But the conversation was cut short by the arrival of Zef Klawitz, Bastion's dad, who promptly fired the teacher. His only words to Bastion were a curt reminder of his lucky escape. Aunt Maria knew her brother was off his rocker. She couldn't bear to see Bastion live in such conditions, so she reached out to his mother's family, and soon, Bastion was whisked away by the Eilis clan. Back in the present, Aunt Maria isn't pleased with Sandrine. 
She believes it's disrespectful to label her a divorcee when the process isn't over yet. Although she acknowledges that Bastion needs a bride, she also recognizes that relying on the Lavier clan could be a threat to their own. Nonetheless, Bastion appreciates Aunt Maria's understanding. At least someone gets him, he thinks, as she advises him to keep an open mind. The scene then shifts to our leading lady, Odette, who's sharing a cup of coffee with Madame Countess Trier, the late Emperor's aunt's daughter. Countess Trier playfully scolds Odette for looking so much like her but admits she's glad her father did something right for his children. It's quite obvious she dropped by to check on them when she asks for Duke's whereabouts. Nonetheless, Odette gives her a quick response, telling her how late he will likely return. Not that she's losing any sleep over it, she can't stand the guy. The air is thick with tension as Odette asks why she's there, and Madame spills the beans about a marriage proposal from the Imperial family. Marriage? Are you kidding me? Odette blurts out, unable to hide the disgust in her voice. The elderly lady remains unfazed, clearing her throat before dropping the bombshell, they want her to marry Bastion Clawitz. Odette's eyes widen in shock. She struggles to understand why the Emperor would want this. The conversation shifts to Princess Isabel, who apparently has a crush on Bastion. But that's not all, he's a commoner, which makes him unfit for the princess. Odette absorbs the news silently, maintaining her composure. She wonders if she's just a pawn in their game, but is reassured when she learns that Bastion doesn't share Isabel's feelings. Madame Countess Trier then goes on to talk about the Clawitz clan. Despite their lack of title, they're known for their acumen and have been running a successful business for generations. They're even dubbed the Empire's Kings of Railways. Bastion's father married into a noble family, which elevated his status. But there's a catch, Bastion, the eldest son from his first wife, comes from a lowly bloodline. His mother's family, the Ailes, might be wealthy, but they earned their fortune through shady business dealings. In high society, Bastion is often referred to as the grandson of the junk merchant. The conversation shifts back to the marriage proposal. Madame Trier tries to persuade Odette to accept, revealing that Bastion's father dislikes him and he won't be inheriting anything. She also mentions that Bastion doesn't want to marry into Duke's family. After some contemplation, Odette tells her to relay her thoughts to the Emperor. But the Madame is quick to correct her, it's an order, not a request. Madame Trier encourages Odette to take a chance on Bastion. You never know, she says, Bastion Clawitz could be the man who falls head over heels for you. Fast forward to Bastion's personal townhouse. His butler, Lovis, is at the door, waiting for his arrival. As Bastion steps inside, Lovis notes that the party must have run late. But Bastion is in high spirits, excited about the relationships he needs to maintain. He has no plans of retiring anytime soon. Lovis informs him of a letter from a certain Lady Odette. Bastion draws a blank, so Lovis fills him in, she's from the Emperor. With that, Lovis retires for the night, leaving Bastion alone with the letter. As he stares at it, the reality of the situation sinks in, he's getting married. Apparently, a few days earlier, Bastion got a surprise visit from Marquis Demel, the naval hotshot. Demel dropped the bombshell. The Emperor wants Bastion hitched to Lady Odette, daughter of the legendary Helene. As he sunk into his cushy couch, Bastion couldn't help but feel a wave of disappointment wash over him. Seriously, Emperor? He's got to think about the Emperor's honor, but man, this was tough. He finally plucked up the courage to read the letter. And there it was, her name written in the corner of the letter, throwing him into another deep thought session. Fast forward a bit, and we've got Odette clutching a piece of paper like it's a lifeline. She's jittery but decides to bite the bullet and read the letter. She's always thought Bastion was a bit of a jerk, especially after that three-line note he sent in response to her heartfelt letter. Now she's left wondering what kind of guy Bastion really is. Backing out crosses her mind, but then she remembers the old lady's words, which felt more like a threat than advice. She glances at the dresses hanging on her wall, her mother's dress among them. She never thought she'd be wearing it under such crummy circumstances. But hey, when the Emperor orders, you obey, right? Still, she makes a mental note to meet this mysterious Imperial dude. After all, if they're gonna tie the knot, she might as well know who she's dealing with. Wednesday comes and we see our red-headed hero Lucas, 
pulling on his boots and grumbling about Navy school being a pain in the backside. He's feeling that familiar knot in his stomach as he voices out his worries. Enter Bastion, chiming in while wrestling with his tie, questioning why he signed up for this gig in the first place. Lucas tells Bastion that his old man might disown him, or worse, if he doesn't tow the family line. He delves deeper into the conversation, asking Bastion if it's all worth it, and drops the news about his father's wish to share a drink with him whenever they both have some free time. Bastion is touched by the invitation, but that doesn't stop Lucas from throwing in some playful jabs. As Lucas heads for the door, Bastion throws a question his way, asking what his secret is. Lucas stops dead in his tracks, giving us a glimpse of his side profile as he mulls over an answer. The hound dog guarding his territory. That's how Count Evald sees me, he thinks to himself, flashing back to a memory when he was bullied by his peers who didn't believe he was Count Evald's son. They taunted him for being the weak link in a family of Navy officers, but Bastion swooped in just in time, giving the bullies a piece of his mind. Lucas was grateful for his knight in shining armor, and Bastion was equally glad to make friends with Count Evald's sensitive son. Ever since then, Lucas has been riding a wave of good fortune, thanks to his connection with the Evald clan. Shaking off the memories, Lucas figures being a hound dog isn't so bad, especially when the rewards are worthwhile. He doesn't get a response from Bastion, so he switches gears, asking about the upcoming meeting with the lady. Bastion gives himself a once-over in the mirror, clearly liking what he sees. When Lucas mentions Sandrine and the potential chaos she could cause, Bastion mutters something about being unable to control the situation. Lucas warns him to tread carefully around a woman like her. Bastion knows that Princess Isabel will soon marry Crown Prince Belov and leave Berg. Until then, he's willing to play along with the marriage plans, confident that the Emperor won't pressure him once he's shown his goodwill. After that, he should be free to marry Sandrine, she's already divorced, after all. His mind is spinning. He can't let this mess derail his plans. It'd be great if Lady Odette turns out to be easygoing, he muses. Later that day, we're treated to the sight of Odette in all her splendor, thanks to her mother's dress. She's seated at a reserved table, waiting for Bastion. Her beauty is breathtaking, her wild hair cascading down to her waist. But confusion mars her features, has she been stood up? Just as she's about to lose patience, a well-dressed man in uniform walks in. The chaperone points him towards his reservation. Odette is taken aback. This is her future husband, but it's not their first meeting. Her mind flashes back to the winner of the bet from the casino on that fateful night. Bastion, so taken aback by her presence in their reserved booth that he double-checks his reservation. The penny finally drops, the duke from the casino wasn't joking about his daughter's royal blood, it has to be her. Being the smooth operator he is, he introduces himself, reminding Odette of their previous encounter. But our girl isn't easily impressed, she watches his every move as he fixes himself a cup of joe. When she finally breaks the silence, her words are laced with thinly veiled accusations. But Bastion doesn't get defensive. He admits he had no clue about the Emperor's plans, nor did he know her father was a duke willing to sell off his daughter, the Emperor's niece, for cash. His words hit Odette hard, disappointment creasing her forehead. She realizes that Bastion wants nothing to do with her or this arranged marriage, a sentiment she shares, thank goodness. She's not great at hiding her feelings, though, and pretty much begs Bastion to reject her. Her voice is sharper than before, but Bastion meets her gaze and reassures her he won't reject her. He even compliments her dignity, something he noticed from their first meeting. But when he brings up the rumors about her family, she acknowledges them with a roll of her eyes and an increasing impatience. Then, plot twist. Bastion reveals his true intentions, to stay loyal to the Emperor. When Odette misunderstands this as him wanting to marry her, he quickly sets her straight, explaining how difficult it would be to marry her. He suggests they play along until Princess Isabel gets married. But when Odette misinterprets this as tricking the Emperor, he clarifies that they need to make their pretend relationship look believable. He also reminds her of his title and the importance of obeying the Emperor's orders. Odette brings up the potential damage to his reputation from her family's scandalous history, but Bastion couldn't care less. He's no gentleman, after all. With a cheeky smirk, he advises her not to worry about what others think. He mentions something about the Emperor valuing his daughter's opinion more than a Navy officer's and hints at Odette having a reason for agreeing to meet him. 
but he doesn't linger on the topic. Instead, he's up and heading for the exit. Odette calls after him, offering to pay for the tea so she won't owe him anything. But Bastion just laughs it off, advising her to save her money, especially given her father's gambling habits. When she asks what he means, his response leaves her stunned, she might not be so lucky next time. As she watches him leave, she can't shake the feeling that he looks down on her. But he's still willing to follow the Emperor's order, just pretending to be engaged until the princess gets married. His plans will definitely make things work. She watches him as he exits the building. In the next scene, Odette is trudging home, her heart heavy with disappointment. That meet up with Bastion? A total disaster. She's swearing off seeing him again but knows she's stuck in this crazy situation. As she nears her house, shouts ring out like a bad rock concert. She breaks into a sprint, her mind filled with worry about her little sis, Tira. She edges towards the slightly open door, spotting Tira in a heated face-off with their dad. He's trying to snatch away their hard-earned savings, but Tira isn't backing down. Suddenly, he raises his hand, and Odette takes the hit. She jumped in front of Tira like some kind of action hero. Their dad is stunned. Odette doesn't miss a beat. She gets up, warning her dad to never lay a finger on Tira again. When he doesn't back down, she drops the bombshell, if he doesn't stop, she'll cut off his subsidy from the Imperial family. Her words hang in the air, her gaze steady and fierce. He finally backs off, stomping off while hurling curses at them. Odette watches him go, wondering how much more drama this day can dish out. But she knows she's her dad's Achilles heel, as long as he gets that subsidy, he won't let go of his daughters. Even though they have different moms, Odette loves Tira and will do anything to protect her. Don't be weak, she tells herself, ready to face whatever comes next. As night falls, Lovis strides over to Bastion with an invitation to the Empress's birthday party. Bastion admires the fancy invite, looking forward to the glam and glitter of the royal ball. But there's something else on his mind too, Odette. Fast forward to the big day. Nobles in their fancy carriages head to the Imperial Palace. Among them is the Clawwitz family. Count Clawwitz can't contain his excitement about being recognized as a noble family. But his son Franz seems clueless about his dad's enthusiasm. The Count fills him in, but Franz isn't buying it. This leads to some tension in the carriage, with the Countess trying to lighten the mood by bringing up Lady Dyson's attendance at the ball. But her husband's harsh response only stirs the pot. He dismisses Dyson as a beggar, not a duke or noble. Then, the conversation shifts to Bastion's marriage plans, and the Count just can't get why his son would want to tie himself to such a scandal-ridden family. Clearly, this night is just getting started, and there's plenty of drama still to come. The Countess is sitting there, her gaze fixed on her husband but her mind is off in La La Land. She's thinking about how her family, Viscount Oswald's crew, managed to get the Clawwitz clan into the upper echelons of society. But that fancy status? It only covers her, hubby dearest, and Franz. Elite society doesn't roll out the red carpet for folks from humble beginnings, even if it's Bastion. Yet somehow, that kid managed to claw his way up here. She remembers Jeff and how she had to send his ex-wife packing to make room for herself. Just thinking about it makes her smile like the cat that got the cream. What a hoot! Keeping up her angelic smile, she responds to Franz's question about Odette bringing honor to their clan. Her words are as sharp as a chef's knife as she crosses Odette off the honorable list. Franz tries to keep the conversation going, but his folks shut him down, telling him to focus on himself and his bro's appearance at the ball. After all, they need to show off what the Clawwitz heir is made of. Next scene. The Imperial Palace is decked out in all its red and gold glory, filled to the brim with nobles and royalties. The Herald announces the big shots as they arrive, and to everyone's surprise, he calls out Captain Bastion Clawwitz. Franz watches his half-brother from the sidelines, his thoughts as dark as a stormy night. He labels Bastion a cowardly critter, poor guy. Franz is simmering in his own pool of hatred when a fellow nobleman strides past him to greet Bastion. The nobles swarm around Bastion, making him both pleased and peeved. Franz, on the other hand, is green with envy. His fiancée, Ella von Klein, comments on the interaction between Duke Gerhard and Bastion. Suddenly, Bastion spots Franz in the crowd and heads over to chat with him and his fiancée. 
the brothers exchange pleasantries, and then the herald announces the arrival of the Lady of Duke Dyson's family. Franz's smile widens, thinking Odette will be the downfall of his brother's first imperial ball. But boy, is he wrong. Odette steps into the spotlight, looking every bit the royal lady she is. She glides across the room, her hair neatly styled and her gown sparkling like a starry night. Franz can't help but gape at her beauty, his mind spinning. The party is in full swing, with music filling the air and people dancing their hearts out. The emperor and empress are also enjoying the festivities from their thrones. All eyes are on Captain Bastion and Lady Odette, including Franz who just can't seem to take his eyes off them. What a night to remember! The royal dance wraps up and Bastion pulls Odette into a chat. He's thinking she's in way over her head, but then she spills the beans. The Imperial Order? It's a big deal for her. She's ready to play her part, or so he thinks. But wait a second, there's something that's not quite adding up for him. Odette's reputation is on the line here, and she knows it. That only means one thing, she's got a request for the Emperor. Both of them have their own agendas, and Bastion figures they can use that to their advantage. As he twirls her around in the dance, causing her to fall into his arms, he whispers about how she can win over the Majesty with her actions. Rewinding a bit, we see Odette and Countess Trier having a heart-to-heart -heart as they stroll down the hallway after the party. The madam reminds Odette that the future of the Dysons family is riding on her shoulders. She needs to be on her best behavior and keep her promise to convince the Majesty to keep the subsidy for her family, even if the marriage goes south. The older woman assures her that she's got her back. Odette thanks her and heads back to the ballroom. The madam watches her go, feeling sorry for her. She knows Odette must be overwhelmed by this whole new world. She may have brought her to the ball, but it still doesn't feel right to see her being used like this. But Odette? She's busy admiring the palace, her mind wandering back to stories her mom used to tell about the Imperial Palace. Her mom would get so excited whenever she talked about the Grand Garden in full bloom. Suddenly, Odette breaks down in tears. She's filled with regret. Why did she choose this path? She thinks about her mom who betrayed her country and family for a fleeting love. Once that love was gone, there was nothing left. But Odette vows to never live like that. She refuses to trade her dignity for wealth. Money is important, yes, but it shouldn't come at the cost of her life. I'm betting my subsidy on this marriage. But I know I will be looked down on. I only need a reason to put up a play with this man, she says as she heads back to the ballroom. Back to Bastion, he gives her a quick pep talk, reminding her to keep up the act because everyone's watching, especially Isabel. He takes a moment to admire her outfit and jewelry, throwing in a compliment or two. But then he ruins the moment by asking if she's planning to return the jewelry after the party. She gives him a blank look, remembering some of the things she knows about him. She finally responds, holding her head high. She tells him that she rented the jewelry and that she's got enough money for other things. But Bastion doesn't stop there. He teases her about being richer than he thought and she fires back, thanking him for his concern. They go back and forth like ping pong until finally, a mutual understanding emerges. Bastion voices his concerns about Odette's spending habits, which she surprisingly agrees with. Feeling confident, he invites her to a fancy dinner. But Odette's not having any of it. She makes up an excuse that's as clear as day, she doesn't want to get tangled in debts she can't pay off. Yet, they continue to dance, looking like two lovebirds on the dance floor. In jest, Bastion suggests selling her off to cover the debts, but Odette's not buying it. She reminds him of their first meeting and how he didn't exactly make the best impression. Odette is one tough cookie, always holding her head high and refusing to accept defeat. Bastion can't help but admire her, his gaze lingering on her long, graceful neck. But his thoughts are interrupted by a sudden twist in the story. Princess Isabel makes her grand entrance, striding down the stairs towards them, completely unfazed by the whispers around her. As she gets closer, she lands a slap on Odette's cheek, commanding her to steer clear of Bastion. To add insult to injury, she labels her a beggar. Behind the scenes, it turns out that the princess had been watching Bastion and Odette from the gallery, seething with anger. She blames her mother for letting her attend the ball and witness Bastion with his new flame. Yet, 
She insists she's over him and can't be hurt. She reflects on how she's watched him for the past six years, realizing that he's only dancing with Odette due to an imperial order, not because he likes her. A war hero with humble origins and the daughter of an abandoned princess, what a juicy combo that's sure to grab the attention of the elites. This might even be enough to overshadow the odd rumors about her. But how does Bastion feel about being stuck in this predicament? She feels sorry for him, thinking she's the only one who truly understands his feelings. She's convinced he loves her but can't express it because of his loyalty to the military. She wonders if he's suppressing his feelings for her because of their status difference. She thinks Odette is just playing a role for money and doesn't understand Bastion's situation. The tension skyrockets, and we're all wondering how Odette will handle this curveball. Princess Isabel, now in full attack mode, accuses Odette of doing all this to escape her slum life, even at the cost of her self-respect. Odette is stunned into silence, staring at the floor in shock and embarrassment. Bastion tries to defuse the situation, but Isabel spills the beans about Odette trying to seduce him for his wealth, labeling her a courtesan. Despite the harsh words, Odette knows she can protect her heart. She's certain she won't get hurt because she's not sincerely involved. She's just playing a part for the Imperial Order. As she picks up the broken necklace from the floor, she reflects on everything that's unfolded, ready to face whatever comes next. Isabel isn't done though. She accuses Odette of being a gold digger, only interested in shiny trinkets. But when Odette stays mum, Isabel gets even more riled up. Odette hands her broken necklace off to a chaperone for safekeeping and turns back to the drama. Isabel, fuming at being ignored, moves to confront Odette. But before she can, Bastion swoops in and saves the day. He calls Isabel's name and locks eyes with her. She's so taken aback by his handsome features that she forgets her anger and melts into his arms. In her tipsy state, she convinces herself that he loves her and that's why he's come to her rescue. But poor Bastion is just trying to keep the peace. He can't help but cringe at the strong smell of alcohol on her breath. He tells her she's had too much to drink and tries to calm her down with a comforting hug. Meanwhile, the Empress watches the whole scene unfold from the gallery above. She's so embarrassed by Isabel's behavior that she falls to her knees in tears. The palace is buzzing with whispers and hushed conversations. The Clawitz family can't help but worry that this spectacle will tarnish their reputation. And through all this chaos, Isabel continues her drunken display. Bastion has had enough and pushes her away, disappointment written all over his face. Isabel's brother steps in and drags her away, but she's too lost in her fantasies to snap back to reality. With Isabel gone, Bastion turns his attention back to Odette. He notices her tucking a loose strand of hair behind her ear and wonders what could have rattled her. He thinks back to the night he won her in a bet and how she never lost her cool. He admires her resilience and decides she deserves a proper greeting. As they approach Madame Countess Trier, Bastion notices Odette looking a bit pale. He whispers to her to keep her composure so they don't attract any more attention. The Countess, on the other hand, can't help but be intrigued by Bastion's aristocratic demeanor. She wonders why he's never been invited to the palace before. When they finally reach the Countess, she asks Bastion about his time with Odette. He tells her he enjoyed their time together and bids them good night. The Countess and Odette chat for a while, but Odette is starting to feel the strain of the evening. Still, the Countess congratulates her on handling the night so well and shares some fond memories of Odette's late mother. With that, they call it a night, leaving Odette to reflect on the eventful evening. The drama between Bastion and Odette is just beginning. Want us to continue? Comment Bastion below. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't. Until next time, ciao.